more concerned about getting the person who goes out. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, thank you very much for being here today, where we are, of course, going to be talking about sustainability and technology, investing in the future with the European Innovation Council. As you can see, my name is Jennifer Baker. I'm an EU policy journalist, and I'll be your moderator today. So it's delightful to see so many of you here in these warm hosted offices, as well as so many joining online across Europe and who knows, perhaps even further afield. So a very big welcome to you as well, joining remotely. Now, our objectives today are to showcase successful scalers in Europe. So 
We want to thank, of course, BPA France for hosting us today and the French Presidency who have been instrumental in getting this organised together and, of course, the EIC. Now, we know that startups are, are, are very important to us, but arguably more important and more difficult is the scale-up stage. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And that scale-up stage is essential to the European economy, particularly as we bounce back from the pandemic, from other crises and so on. Now, those of you online, please do join in the conversation. I would like to hear your thoughts. Use the hashtag ScaleUpEU. Share on social media, maybe get your colleagues involved. And of course, you here in the room, please keep your phones handy as well, as we will be interacting with you using some online tools. So first of all, I will say there's QR codes. You've seen them around stuck to the walls. There's also on the brochure, you can find the QR code to download the app. And with that, you can arrange one-on-one -on -one meetings with our amazing company. So please do that as well. We're also going to use Slido. So you can go on your browser to slido.com or SLI, dot do and put in the hashtag for today's event which of course is scale up europe we're going to have an icebreaker question there so i'm going to ask what is your profile who do you represent where are you coming from and there's options there there's business investments business enabler legislator and others so while you're doing that let me briefly give you an overview of our agenda today in a moment we'll be having a word of welcome from our host then there will be a big announcement from EIC, so you want to stay around for that. That will be followed by our main panel. We're asking in that panel discussion, what do we know about European scalers and unicorns? Then Virel Pecker, the EIC Business Acceleration Services and Transition Head of Unit, will be telling us all about the hows, the whys, and the wherefores of the EI Scale Up 100. And then before that, we will wrap up for the morning part of the agenda with Ismia and BPA France. In the afternoon, there will be pitches. I'm sure you'll want to hear all about that. That's for our on-site audience, and I will tell you a bit more about that later on. Let's see now, do we have the results of that slide poll? Have people voted? Can we have a look and see? Okay, a huge number there from investment by far. Business, then other business. No legislators in the room, so let's all speak freely about that. Now, I mentioned earlier on that we're coming out of the pandemic. And of course, we seem to be almost in a state of perma crisis. We had a financial crisis. We've had a migration crisis. We have an ongoing climate crisis. We've had the pandemic. We now see the war in Ukraine. And I don't want that to sound too negative today, but we should bear in mind that sometimes innovation is born out of adversity and that some of the scale ups we're going to hear about today are actually the ones that can get us back on track and build this sustainable, resilient future that we talk about so much. There are five unicorns in EIC's portfolio, Cellink, Sword Health, Clean Farm, BioArtic and Relax Solutions. And I think it's significant that three of these are involved in health in some way, as we realise how interconnected we are in this world and coming out of the pandemic, the importance of working together for pharmaceuticals, for medicines, and we've seen the incredible work that can be done when we put our minds together for something like the vaccine. And the first EIC funded company to achieve unicorn status was Cellink. And they have released the first universal BioInc back in 2016. And their current valuation is 2.7 billion. Sword Health is a digital musculoskeletal care provider using wearable technology to deliver tailored health solutions. Bioartic is a research funded biopharma company focusing on innovative treatments in areas with high unmet medical needs. Relax Solutions is a cutting edge retail optimization service. So not one of the medical ones, but something that we see has been increasingly important during the pandemic and now with the war in Ukraine is that we need resilient supply chains as well. We need to see that these cutting edge technologies are actually helping to deliver what we need to our shops. It's not just our bodies that were affected, it was everything else. Another success story is Infarm. It's a Berlin-based startup which it achieved unicorn status just at the end of last year in 2021. And their evaluation today is over 1 billion. And they're involved in sustainability, another one of these key objectives to build back better. Let's take a short look at a short video from Infarm uh, to tell us why the EIC is so necessary. So the European Innovation Council has been absolutely instrumental in giving us funds exactly when we needed it. 
it was really the final injection of energy we needed um, in order to finalize our prototype, our early prototype, um, and manage to close our first major deal with a German retailer. And this in turn allowed us to raise our first seed money. Um, and this was after so many hundreds of different investors that have rejected us uh, for the reason I, I mentioned before. It was a, a new business, unproven um, founders without that are not coming from the field, team that is fairly inexperienced. So having the European Commission take their bet and saying there is something here has completely changed everything. And I think it's very safe to say that without the EU support, we would not be able to do what we've done and. I'm very grateful for that. That's an amazing opportunity that we have, we've got. In addition, being part of the EAC network has really allowed us to um, connect with like-minded companies and institutions. And we're still working with those companies today in changing how we grow, how we eat, um, and how we think about food. So thank you. Well, just a short snapshot there of what we can expect to talk about later today on our panel. I am going to launch another Slido poll now. We've got an open-ended one. The next question we're asking you to put in is, what do you want to see from today? What are your expectations? Put in whatever word, be that tips, be that collaboration, be that information and funding or facts and figures, whatever it is you hope to see. And we'll come back in a while and have a look at what people are hoping to gain from today and hopefully deliver that for you as well. But I'm very happy now to turn over the floor to our host today here in BPA France, CEO and General Director Nicolas Dufourc. Nicolas. Oh, he is still making his way to the room, in which case I will throw some more facts and figures at you. Um, one of the things that over the last few years, over the pilot phase up to 2020, was the EIC supported 5,500 startups and SMEs located in 39 countries. All the EU member states were represented there. And they've managed to crowd in 9.6 billion euros in follow-on investments. And out of these companies, 91 have reached Centaur status, which is an evaluation of over 100 million euros. So around 20% of these have a female CEO. That was in 2020. Perhaps the figures have moved to improve even since then. And as of 2020, 90.5% of the portfolio of the EIC accelerator companies are developing innovations that address at least one sustainable development goal. And I think we're going to try and tie all that in today. I mentioned earlier the perma crises, the various goals we want about sustainability and about resilience. We also see that there are 86 investment agreements that have been subscribed and 240 million euros disbursed to startups as well. Looking ahead to the future, we will see 1,168 million euros are budgeted for the EIC accelerator in 2022. So there are opportunities out there and we're going to talk today about how best to seize them. Having a look at the Slido poll, asking people what they want to find from today's event, we will see <laughs> find investment or smart money. Uh, yes, indeed, of course, that's always very keen. Someone very specifically wants 1.5 million in investment. Inspiration on how to scale up sustainable technology, I see is one of the key thoughts there. Inspiration in general, how to contact investors, how to get your hands on that money, as well as inspiration for ideas. And I'm pretty sure we see in there ways to collaborate as well. So do please keep using the hashtag scale up EU, share your thoughts online and make sure that we keep everyone engaged and involved. I can tell you a little bit more about some of these companies that we were talking about earlier. For example, Cellink is actually a pioneer of 3D cell cultivation systems in pharmaceutical research and drug development. And it's significant that we see these deep tech companies leading the way in investment and leading the way towards unicorn status because deep tech is one of the issues that we actually sometimes find it difficult to define. And that's one of the questions I'll be asking our panelists a little bit later on. Let me check, do we have Nicola ready to go yet? Or are we still holding out hope? Okay. <laughs> so I will tell you then a little bit later on who we're going to have. We're going to talk a lot about funding and scale-up support. And we're going to talk about the scale-up and the EIC ecosystem partnerships and co-investment scheme 
and support programs as ways to do that. We're going to look at the successful examples of collaboration. And I do want to get from your side, we will have lots of networking opportunities here as we are back meeting in person to actually discuss those and to really look at ways where we can work together because when you get people into a room, hopefully magical things happen. So that is why we are so keen to have these pitches this afternoon. I know our online audience, unfortunately, will not be able to join us for our pitching sessions this afternoon, but there are parallel tracks and I'm sure you will not want to miss them. We're going to hear about about workshops for scaling up companies, workshops on ecosystem partnerships and sustainability, and the ecosystem partnerships on deep tech. So as well as all of that to come this afternoon. I am gonna take a short break because I think we're gonna wait for Nicholas to come. Is he, can I get an indication? Okay, <laughs> well, uh, okay. Uh, I think perhaps I'm gonna take a short break and we will come back to Nicholas when he arrives. Well, thank you very much indeed. We are delighted to have you here today, as we said, hosting us in Paris. So with no further ado, please, the floor is yours, sir. Nicolas Dufoc, CEO and General Director of BPA France. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you to start your day with us here at BPI. You're mostly welcome. So I think that's the first time we have an event uh, of EIC uh, in, in, in the BPI uh, headquarters, I think. Uh, so it's auspicious. And we're very happy for that. Uh, so, so as you all know, we have um, a, a long-standing collaboration with EIC, with Jean-David and all the teams. Uh, um, because, of course, the, the, the targets, the objectives, the, the strategic uh, vision and objectives are just the same, just the same. Yeah. Uh, just absolutely like the, you say, the Russian puppets? Les poupées russes. On dit ça? The matriarchas. Okay. So it means that it is coordinated, coherent, and so forth. As far as BPI is concerned, uh, so we are full speed in the deployment of the deep tech plan of BPI. Uh, so for the, the, the non-French representatives uh, today, who, who, is, who, is, who is not French here today? Okay, good. So, so uh, it's, it's a good occasion for me to update you on what we do as far as deep tech is concerned. We have launched in, in January uh, 2019 uh, the, the BPI France Deep Tech Plan, 2.5 billion uh, euros, uh, aiming at uh, regenerating a significant deal flow of deep tech startup out of the French uh, universities. Why did we decide to do that? Because uh, af after you know those years, which were uh, 
14, 15, 16, 17, uh, and 18, which were mostly dedicated to the classical verticals, which were digital, um, everything which is the world of platforms, the world of Zuckerberg, I would say, yeah? But also biotech and medtech, this was, this was the focus of the bank at that time. We sort of missed another massive um, world of innovation, which is the deep tech out of the French laboratories. So we decided to tackle that, and uh, by doing that, we also decided to uh, face the reality of uh, the necessity of a cultural change in the French universities as far as startup creation is concerned. Technology transfer, startup creation, and so forth. So we started uh, a movement which is, which is called uh, the Deep Tech Movement, in the French universities, meeting uh, uh, hundreds of uh, researchers to convince them to create startups. And then to offer them the uh, consulting services and, and the financial uh, tools that allow them to deploy their, their dreams. Uh, uh, at that time, beginning of uh, 2019, there was uh, an average of 50 uh, creations of startup per year. Now we're at 250 and our objective is to go to 500 per year, uh, uh, deep tech startup. So we're on the road. It's, uh, it's not easy. It's not easy. Uh, it, it needs to massively simplify the technology transfer processes, uh, which are depending on peculiarities of uh, the, the, the different scientific uh, centers of France. Uh, it's different in Strasbourg, in uh, Physique et Chimie de Paris, in Lyon, in Toulouse, and so forth. So we try to harmonize all that. We have created a, a national platform for technology transfer. Um, we try to you know, publish benchmarks between the universities on, on, the, on the average number of months for, for, for the transfers and so forth. So we try to be, as much as possible, close to the best performers of OTTs in Europe, so in your countries. And we know we are still not exactly at, at, the, at the target, I mean, except for some universities. Uh, uh, we try to simplify the, the legalities around that, and, and then um, we try to also accompany the researchers so that they, they decide the move, ma massive, major move for them, which is to, to create startups. Uh, so today, uh, in the EIC program, the 37 uh, deep tech startups, you have nine coming from France from different regions. One, one is from uh, Saint-Etienne, as I can remember, L'Actifs, we have invested in it. And, um, and a couple of others are from Paris and the different regions. Then comes the toolbox of BPI. And, and maybe a word on, on BPI, which is something which is, uh, I, I would say, unique in Europe, huh? because you have in one hand here the whole toolbox. That is, you can, you can of, of course, push um, consulting services again which are necessary, but then after seed capital to gross capital, uh, innovation loans, seed loans financed by Europe, by the European Investment Fund, and then um, you have also uh, subsidies, significant uh, volumes of, su of subsidy, uh, reimbursable advances, you have some convertible obligations dedicated to tech, that we have deployed, extremely convenient not to dilute the founders. Um, I mean, many examples of what you can do. Huh? The volumes now of BPI, as far as innovation financing is concerned, have become massive. When we created the bank 10 years ago, it was approximately 1 billion per year, everything comprised. Now it is 6 billion, 6 billion of innovation financing per year. Huh? So that's quite a lot of money now. Huh? And uh, so that allows us to, I mean, you know the figures. I mean, the, 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 the growth of the tech ecosystem of the country is, is really impressive, I would say. And the volume of, uh, of, of capital which has been raised, um, you know, semester after semester has consistently increased also very significantly. Uh, so, I mean, we have the means, we have the dry powder. Uh, what, what needs now to be really uh, oiled more than it's the case today, even if we have made a lot of progresses, is the deal flow of that new generation of uh, researchers, entrepreneurs. That's, that's, what we, that's really what we, what we target. 
having in having in mind <coughs> the best performers of some centers, which are of course uh, in Israel, I would say in, in Boston, in uh, some parts of California, but not all. Uh, we look at uh, Oxford, we look at uh, Louvain, uh, we look at uh, Munich. All those centers are interesting centers as far as the volume again of uh, of transfer uh, to economy of the science is is concerned. That's that's what we want to achieve in France. Some words on BPI to to start with. So you have a you have a, I think a whole day of uh, of testimonies on, on on those questions. I wish you uh, a good time. It's a collective intelligence. So uh, I hope my teams, which are in the room and. Uh, I say hello to them. We'll capture all, all the possible uh, intelligent messages so that we can implement in France. Thank you, and again, thank you to Jean-David to be present today with us. Th thank you very much indeed. Now, I did promise you an announcement, and we are going to have that now. We are also going to have a short press conference afterwards. I know that there are some journalists in the room, so watch out for that once we've heard from the stage here from our speakers, Jean-David Malo, Director of ISMIA, and also Philip Naughton, CEO and founder of CPearl. So, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, great honor to be here in Paris. And first of all, many thanks uh, again to BPI for hosting us. Uh, as uh, Nicolas said, it's not the first time we are working together, but uh, it's the first concrete cooperation that we have in the context of the current framework program for research and innovation. And uh, we have great news today. We have great news today. I'm very proud of it because uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a very important moment, it's a, mo a real momentum for the European Innovation Council in the context of uh, Horizon Europe, because we have the privilege in front of you to announce you the first investment of the European Innovation Council in the frame of Horizon Europe after the pilots that we had uh, in Horizon 2020. Uh, and it's with a French company. <laughs> It happens that it is a French company. But even more than this, uh, a French company which is uh, dealing with uh, one of the key strategic issues that uh, we have in uh, our European agenda, which is uh, linked to uh, high computing. But uh, I will let uh, Philippe, the CEO of Cyperl, because this is the name of the company, let you know uh, a bit more in a, in a second about it. Um, the EIC is very proud, in fact, to support Cyperl with uh, 2.5 million euro of grants, but also uh, 15 million euro of equity investments. And we are sure that other investors, we know already that other investors will join us in order to help you. But uh, before giving uh, the floor to, to Philippe uh, to uh, tell you more about uh, this very promising company, I'm sure one of our future unicorn in Europe, uh, just to tell you that uh, today is also an anniversary for us. It's the second year of the creation of the EIC fund. And I would like to thank Stefan for this, my head of department, who was very instrumental for this. And it means also that we are back. I mean, I'm sure that you heard that we had some difficulties in the last months uh, for administrative purpose. Uh, so we uh, moved uh, to a restructuration of our fund in order to fit with some uh, legal requirements. Uh, but with this announcement, we are very proud to tell you that uh, we are back on track. And even more than this, uh, we have now a very important pipeline of projects uh, that we would like to, to support. Uh, we have already identified and selected more than 145 startup and SMEs in the last one year and a half, in which we will invest together with other investors because we are working with a crowding in approach. Uh, and certainly, I'm sure that uh, our host today uh, will accompany us with uh, a number of these uh, investments. 
So uh, many thanks and congratulations again to you, Philippe, uh, for this uh, announcement today. The floor is yours. Better now? Yeah. So, sorry for that. Uh, at Cyperl, we are very, very proud to be the first direct equity investment of the IC fund. So, Cyperl, it's a European story. Cyperl was born under the umbrella of the European Union Innovation Program, EuroHPC, European Processor Initiative, with more than 15 million euros of H2020 on Horizon Europe to, uh, to start. And this continues today. With this first commitment, we announced today the launching of our 100 million euros Series A. It will help us to achieve our goal of bringing to market the high-performance, low-power microprocessor for Europe's supercomputer. Our first range of microprocessor, ROIA, will be instrumental to restore European sovereignties, European technologies, the strategic fields such as medical research, climate modeling, energy management, power grid, and defense. With the rapid growth of Cyprus that our Series A will fuel, we'll also fulfill our promise to turn research investment into industry and jobs in Europe. In two years, Cyprus moved from zero employee to 109 employees, 80% are engineers, in France, Germany, and Spain. Many thanks again. Thank you very much indeed, gentlemen. And of course, there is that press point happening outside. So do follow along and ask your questions and find out more about why the future is bright and what this announcement means. With that, I'd like to turn to our panel discussion part of today and invite on stage my speakers for this session. So we have Kat Borlongen. Ramon Campano, Massimo Portencaso, and Thais Povel. Ladies and gentlemen, please grab a seat. Do we have Kat with us today or no? Well, perhaps she will join as we go through our discussion, do I get an indication from the tech team whether we're expecting Kat to join us at this point? Not a problem. Okay, I think, gentlemen, we will kick start, and I'm sure we'll be able to catch up if and when she does join us. We're talking about setting the scene in this panel what we know about European scalers, European unicorns, how do we define deep tech? There's a lot of areas I want to cover with you. So, Ramon, let me start with you. You're the author of the report In Search of EU Unicorns. So, tell us a bit about what <laughs> you have discovered. I know um, at, at, at the, uh, the, J, uh, the, the Joint Research Centre, the JRC, there's a lot of research done. You have a lot of insights. Um, give us your overview on where we are at the moment. Bonjour, good morning. First of all, I would like to apologize because I have to give, ad, uh, admit when I started this work, I started completely different how I'm talking now. We were asked to say, okay, what can we do to make things better in Europe, to get more startups, more unicorns and so on. And possibly I come now to the conclusion to think only about unicorns is not the correct way to do it. It's not enough. It's far not enough. But I come to this later. And we shifted a little bit the discussion because uh, this discussion did not bring us too far and to say, well, okay, what can we do to make it better? It doesn't matter if it's scale-ups, unicorns, or whatever. What really would have, do we have to do? Scale-up is not only about finance. But I would like to give you a couple of information about finance because it's the most urgent things for you here and how it, it works. So the work we did is simply to say, okay, 
at the end of the day, there are three sources you can get money from. Either you get it from independent investors, you get it from corporates, or you get it from, from, um, uh, from the public hand. Let's, and let's analyze it one by one. What we see from the independent venture capitalists, we see that uh, it has improved in Europe very much in respect of the last five years. It is uh, being, becoming mature, but we still have holes. Okay, we have holes at regional level, at certain areas, for example, in some uh, regions we have seed money, but at overall we have a problem in, in, in scale-ups. What is, what is the situation with uh, uh, corporates? Corporates increasing, they're increasing their money on, uh, on venture capital as well. To give you a flavor, it's about 2% of the, what they invest in research themselves internally. It's not a lot or 3.5% of what they invest into mergers and acquisitions. So there is room for it, but this is smart money because we have shown or we can show that if you have somebody on board at a certain rate range of your development phase, it enhances. And the third issue is how are we doing it with public money? Because public money is between 15 and 35% of all investments in Europe, depending where you are. But you cannot increase this at equilibrium. We have to use it as leverage for others to invest. We cannot permit ourselves to crowd out. We must crowd in. And the good news is we have been improving each time more and more. Can I see the first slide, please? This is the present. What you see here is we did for the EIC an analysis. Oh, thank you showing in these dots here what uh, comparing uh, startup uh, scale ups who did uh, that participated in the EAC, uh, in the SME instrument in the period 2014 and 20 and compared those who got a grant and with those which did not get a grant which are separated with the red line and we did um, a regression analysis and now, now for the moment make a picture in your mind take this into account we look on how the situation is for patents investments assets employees and revenues and age and then we compare it with what happened for those who really got the money can you show the next one you see the jumps yeah we can prove that and that with the regression analysis we made, that um, patents increased about 10%, 10 percent, 10 to 15 percent. The the in the, the the possibility to get investments increased by 10 percent. Assets went up, employees went up, revenues increased, and the, even the 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 failure rate went down by between four to five, uh, 10 percent. That means that the way we are analyzing money. And we, the way we are doing it is correct. It's a correct one. Yeah, it works. The next step we did, next slide, is where does the public, the, 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 the money comes from the private hands. What we see is for the big deals, and you are going to be in the big deals, the money comes mostly from the United States. And basically it comes only from three sources. It comes from Silicon Valley, it comes from the New York, Boston area, and that's it. Mm -hmm. So we, s we find that we have a chicken and egg situation, that not only we th the, the earth is not flat, we have spikes, but the problem is that we have very few funds that really can go into very, very high uh, investment areas. This, next slide, this is the same if you look at the European level. The very big investment come from London. And this is mainly due to the fact that the uh, subsidies of the American companies also located there. This means that we may have a long-term problem for, for Europe because we see in effect that some companies are moving where the money is. Contrary to what you think that money moves where, where, where the excellent is, we see also the alternative effect. Yeah? And this, is n this means that we will find an, an increase in, in money. Next slide, please. And this is the last one. Is if I look where companies investing, mm -hmm. corporates, we find a disturbing effect. 
the as I told you before, they're investing each time more. It's the good news. The bad news is that European companies mostly invest in US startups. Mm -hmm. What you see here is the, the, the Scandi uh, diagram where the investment flows are going. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is something we have to, to, to turn around. Obviously, normally this does not appear very often because they're doing through their subsidies in the United States. And with this, I finish my presentation. I hope it was not too long. Thank you, Ramon. And I know you had those prepared because obviously the work of the JRC is it's complicated. We need to drill down into the figures. Kat Borlegan, thank you very much for being here. You're EIC board member and chief impact officer at Content Square. Give us your overview perspective, your kind of overarching umbrella thoughts on what we need to know and what we should focus on with EU scale-ups. That's like a, that's a really big question. <laughs> I know. Um, so, um, hi everyone. Just before I sort of get started, I just want to get a feel of the room. How many people here are founders or work at uh, actually work at startups? Great. And some investors, maybe. All right. And uh, I see some government in the room. Come on, Philippe, you can raise your hand. It's okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so, I mean, I might have a very kind of strange perspective. Um, so, my name is Kat Berlanga, and maybe uh, uh, you know, uh, prior to uh, prior to my current role right now, which is Chief Impact Officer of Content Square, which, for those of you who don't know it, is um, essentially one of France's biggest unicorns. We are a UX analytics company, 1,600 people today in over 10 geographies, doubling in size every year. Um, uh, acquiring at least a couple of companies every year with all of the challenges and you know all of the high points and low points that it comes with but you know not too long ago really just about you know six eight months ago I was actually in, um, in government um, my uh, my hat was as director of La French Tech which was really much more on the policy making supporting um, and sort of like community uh, uh, management side of, of, of the space, right? So I can tell you some things for, with like both hats, like both from how I saw it uh, on the outside as a policymaker and how I'm, experi I'm experiencing it today. Um, you know, on the outside, we look at the macro numbers, right? And I still remember all of the songs from the time I had to do all of the speeches back when I was at French Tech. Uh, you know, um, you know some of the numbers that you know we actually have Philippe here who we worked on, uh, we worked on together on, on this really cool initiative called Scale Up Europe, which was uh, used to kick off the French presidency and specifically show that its overall importance. And some of the numbers that you know we fished out were numbers like 171 billion, which is essentially an amount of investment that went into the U.S. and not into France, uh, which is five five times the number uh, that year, uh, just you know, so we, we, we keep our eye on the ball. Um, you know, we were looking at numbers like the overall, like sort of usual vanity metrics, right? Like overall progression of number of unicorns, number of decacorns. Um, we even had this goal uh, that was uh, declared by President Macron uh, last year, which was, what was it, 10 decacorns by 2030, if I'm not mistaken, right? What? Hectacorns, sorry, <laughs> we're like totally different um, level of uh, uh, level of uh, for for Europe, by the way, different level of um, of ambition, um, and and so you're looking at things from from this very uh, macro perspective, and from a macro perspective, and that's the perspective that I see also um, as a board member of the European Innovation Count Council. You're looking at things like, hey, you know. Everything looks great, it feels super dynamic, but we're still super behind, and the goal is not necessarily to just support the deep tech ecosystem, if I'm being really honest, right? The goal is mostly to make sure that Europe becomes one of the best possible, like the best home um, for deep tech startups, especially deep tech startups that want to make a difference um, in the ecosystem. And when you're looking at that, you know, you're, 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 you're looking at things that you, you know, th that are like really big ticket things, right? Big ticket items, like EIC is 10 billion, um, 10 billion initiative, you know, um, uh, you know, the EIF launched a lot of things, a lot of really, really big um, initiatives. And when you're a startup, you know, which I've kind of been, you know, experiencing right now on the, um, on the, uh, you know, on the leadership team of Content Square, you don't see any of that, right? Um, all you're seeing is like, oh, we have this like weird procurement issue. Uh, we wanted to do some work with government, but like they told it, like their procurement is so like, you know, in incredibly difficult to navigate. Makes no sense to us. Um, or like, okay, great, we have all these public investors. How are they taking into account um, what's happening to the markets today? You know, the 95%, for example, of companies that listed last year um, are all listing below are all listing below IPO price, or 30 to 40% of valuations uh, have uh, have dropped for private companies. 60 to 70% uh, for public 
public companies? What does that mean for us as a company and our valuations and, grow and moving forward, for example? And how does that affect our relationship with our private investors and our public investors? We're also thinking about things um, you know, which the EIC cares about uh, quite a bit, which is uh, ESG, which is 100% you know, of what my job is all about, um, which is you know, as we scale, uh, and you know, for the longest time when we were talking about scaling, we were only talking about numbers. You know, we were only talking about these vanity metrics. But if we are going to be the European deep tech or you know European tech ecosystem, what's going to make us different? Why should we win? Why do we deserve to to you know be on the same level as uh, all of the other countries? And I really believe um, that a lot of it comes from some of the specificities that we have uh, that have to do with how strongly uh, how strongly we defend um, you know uh, environmental, social, and, and 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 governance, right? So essentially ESG things. Um, where we're coming up really strong actually in Europe. Um, I don't know if you're noticing this. Uh, you know, at some of the companies here, I guess, are in earlier stage. But so you know, we've for example at Content Square, I've been meeting with with some banks, thinking about what it's going to be like one day, you know, eventually when become a public company. And something that's really interesting is the people that they ask to be in the room are always like the, C the CFO, of course, the chief legal, of course, and now they ask for the chief impact or chief sustain or you know, VP of sustainability or whatever to be in the room. Because this is now a part of, uh, of the market that we're in, and fortunately it's also a part of the society that we're in. So I guess like, you know, maybe, maybe for the sort of founders in the room, and I guess the investors know this as well, um, it just as you're moving forward, right? Like I, I, I know it can get, it can feel super cutthroat, um, especially with the with the markets today. It can feel feel pretty terrifying. Um, but I think like what's really important is to really keep your eye on the ball um, in terms of where you want to go, where you really want to create value, and how you want to move forward, uh, as opposed to um, you know, as opposed to being distracted sometimes by some of those like the big dazzling um, numbers or big dazzling types of discourses that you know that you may that you may get. Is that good? I think that's a great, I mean, it <laughs> was a very broad question and you've covered a lot. Get a broad answer. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Um, Massimo, you are the founder and managing partner of Deep Wave Ventures. Tell me more about what work you're doing and also about the particular difficulties faced, if you like, by deep tech. Okay. Um, so. With DeepWay, we're working today and right now uh, with uh, EIC, uh, helping the EIC together with TechTool, BPI, and BCG on really looking at creating a blueprint for scaling up uh, companies in, in, in Europe. And before that, I was a BCG and I was in charge of, of the deep tech. I wrote a bunch of reports on deep tech. So I've been looking at the deep tech space for now four, five years, so long before it was uh, a buzzword. And it has been really enlightening to go now through this um, scaling up Europe program because because it was really interesting to see, like, a few years ago, Europe had a startup problem, uh, and today Europe has a scale-up problem, and pretty a, a solid one. Uh, initiatives like the one that are being announced and pushed today are really important, but uh, it's going to take a long time because before we get there. And I agree with uh, Kate that there is a lot of potential in Europe, but there is a very strong asymmetry between the potential in terms of technology and what can be brought to market and the supporting capital market to, to go after that. And there are multiple reasons. It's going to take time to, to challenges. And one of the things that we've been trying to do with, uh, with DeepWave and with the EIC um, program that we're doing on scaling up is really try to understand, okay, there is a capital market part that needs to be addressed, but there is also other things that can be brought to bear um, to improve the state of things. And, and talking to, we spoke to 40, 50 companies, 40, 50 investors, we surveyed them and so on. And what came uh, across is really, yes, there, there is a fundamental capital market issue. And I think it's summarized very in, in we heard this quote from both investors and companies that the classical mindset in the US is investor coming in and asking how big can it get? And can you get faster if, uh, if I give you more money? And the usual question that uh, European investors ask is, how small can the ticket be? And how can we minimize the risk? That's usually the, uh, it's an exaggeration, but it gives an idea of the mindset that is uh, behind this. So setting apart this part, I think we identified, actually initially we thought three, but ultimately there are four main issues that we all collectively can start addressing, we would raise the bar because the capital market will take time, but these are all things that we, both investor and um, startup and entrepreneur can really help addressing. The first one, and it tends to be really underplayed, and <coughs> uh, when we started the project, people told me, and I didn't realize how important it is, which is the importance of narrative. 
and really coming up and telling a compelling story about what you're trying to do. And this is generally important for startup, but it becomes even more important when you're dealing with deep tech and with founders that are highly technical, that usually love their technology, love to talk about their technology, and because of that very often miss the bigger picture what can get an investor excited. So focusing on this one, and I think this is a role that both investors need to help their startup to bring up, because what usually happens, it's, it's a bit of a downward spiral, because you have technical founders, you have investors that ask for the small things and bring me two years revenue and then we're gonna talk about it, and the, the if even the, the, the founder had a compelling vision, it gets beaten out of them very often um, because they say, okay, look, uh, uh, people need to survive. So, you know, you forget <laughs> no big vision if you uh, don't manage to survive. So th the point one is um, importance of narrative and you might think this is an issue for startup. We are seeing a lot of scale up great companies where I've spoken to the founders in separate settings, great, you see them in the pitch and think, oh my God, that's, that, that's not as good as you could be. So point one. Point two, equally, uh, a, a co joint effort that can really improve scaling up in Europe, um, which is the role of boards. Uh, totally underappreciated, but so important, particularly for these kind of companies. And uh, bringing a, a, an expertise point of view, and not only the investor point of view in the boards, is really, 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 really important. And then... <coughs> The, the last, one, the, the third one is the role of corporate because deep tech is about B2B, is not B2C, and your customer are corporates, and corporates are being very, very, very conservative when it comes to this, and that and other are part that really can, can require some, some peace. To close very quickly on your question on what is deep tech, um, <coughs> deep tech ultimately is a, a an era where you have companies that are relying on very strong IP uh, and science to develop their product and their market. This is in the essence. But I think what people usually miss is that actually deep tech is not a thing, but it's an approach toward innovation. The same way there is not a, a, a disruptive technology, technology depending on how you use become disruptive, it's not that there is some, such a thing as a deep technology. Uh, but what is really about deep tech is deep tech is an approach of innovation uh, that allows you to dramatically expand the option space so you can do things that are order of magnitudes better and usually by this definition unknown because it's a, an order of magnitude, it's not incremental and compressing the time to get there. So you expand the option space dramatically, you reduce the time to get there and this makes even more difficult for investors to be able to rent and sell because it's not easy to orient yourself into this. And that's why scaling up is particularly important in this space. Thank you. This, you're a managing partner at DealFlow EU. And I have here, the, the mission statement is to help more startups successfully scale up in Europe. Big broad question for you as well. How do you do that? Yeah, thank you. And maybe I should start with my first mission. When I, uh, after I graduated, I studied physics um, at Imperial, and then I joined the VC fund. And my first mission was first to find these unicorns, these scale-up companies in Europe. And um, I worked for for a decade in venture capital at big funds like Holdspring, and I was getting amazing startups from the U.S. We invested in. Uh, scientific startups, in automated labs, in uh, contract research organizations, how to automate that. And I was really seeing that in the US there was a lot more money going into these kind of startups early stage, and I was missing this in Europe. And uh, actually, Fiorel here in the audience, he opened my eyes about, uh, about six years ago and introduced me to what the European Commission was doing in, f in filling this funding gap. It was really apparent, you know, at uh, big tech conferences, startup conferences, all the startups I was meeting were, you know, uh, e-scooters, marketplaces, um, kind of very, not deep tech, not big innovations. Um, and then thanks, thanks to the uh, amazing work of the, of the European Commission, I started discovering there is a lot more in Europe, uh, but there is a different mindset from the investors, from the startups, uh, the access to finance. There's a lot of dynamics <laughs> that make Europe a much more difficult place for startups to scale up. And um, this is also why we started DealFlow. 
Um, it wasn't six years ago. It took a few years of iterations. I, I left uh, venture capital and I, I wanted to change my mission from finding these unicorns to actually helping them become a possibility. And uh, that's what we now do with at DealFlow. We are working with the EIC. We are helping the companies that they are funding. And I, I think it, it's more about the mission of the EIC. And I think VRL will talk a little bit more about that in detail. Um, and this is where we come as DealFlow. We, we try and help the companies to take that next step uh, that Europe is really lacking behind in. Um, and a big part is also the narrative um, and, and the mindset, how they look at it, and access to finance. So we, the, the EIC is really filling that first step. And then hopefully our investors in Europe, who are much more risk averse, can get access to companies that have received a lot of money to take their first risky steps, to do their first innovations, to get that traction that makes them more interesting for investors. Cash, I think you wanted to jump in with a question there as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I mean it's something I've been thinking about because I actually, you know, haven't been on a panel like this uh, since my previous role, and and you know, I, I'm hearing a lot of things that seem you know pretty similar to the last time that I was on stage. But it's, it's something that I was, you know, hoping all, all three of like different types of expertise would sort of maybe um, be able to lighten us on is the market has like totally changed, right? Like we're like. We're talking about you know something that's super like super low risk right now, high volatility. Um, you know all the valuations are plummeting. Everybody's asking for cash efficiency. Uh, you know for for the deep tech startups that are in the room. You know and the, you know and, and and also like I don't know how many of you are raising around right now. But it's a totally different experience from raising around last year, right? What, what would you what would your you know what are kind of like your insights on this? And what would your advice be for you know um, deep tech startups that are you know that are coming in this particular climate? It, you know, which is very different from, from that of last year? I, th I think it's a very good question that I'm getting a lot from the startups I'm working with. So <laughs> at what we do, we really work with all the startups that got some grant funding that also got an EIC commitment so they can get 10 million, 15 million. And the question is, you know, find a lead investor that wants to join us um, and we will give you that money. So they are really there. They're out there trying to raise money right now. And this question comes up a lot. And uh, what, what we're seeing in the market is that it's a big problem for VCs that their exit valuations are, uh, they dropped because they exited that IPO. So also their entry valuations need to go down. On the other hand, what we're seeing is that this is affecting the valuations much less at seed and pre-seed. It's much more in the later stage where this is really, really uh, evident. Um, one thing I think all startups should keep in mind is that there's a lot of VCs that are very happy that the valuations are dropping right now. And they're trying to use this to their advantage. You can see it also in, in the last crisis in 2008. Sequoia was really pumping a lot of negative news and at the same time they were doing a lot of deals. Um, I think for all the startups some advice is Keep in mind that these VC funds just raised 500 million, 1 billion funds. Like the money at the VC funds is huge right now. They have a window of seven years to deploy this money and they need in the first three years to make maybe 50 deals. If they wait for a whole year and miss those deals, they can't catch up. They're not gonna be able to deploy their money fast enough. And what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing from the investors, and I'm, I'd be very interested to talk to some of the investors in this room, see if they agree. Um, but what I'm hearing is they, they want to do deals, they need to do deals, they need to deploy that capital, but they need to do it at lower valuations. But they still want to fund you. Ramon, let me bring you in, because I wanted to ask you, what are those particular sectors that we see benefiting from support at this juncture? I mean, Kat raised the issue of the current climate. I mean, what do you see from based on your research? Well, there is one area which I think we have a competitive advantage in Europe, which nobody else has in the world. It is that we are having the best legislation on what is sustainability. Yeah. Don't mi underestimate the work that our colleagues are done doing in Brussels right now on the taxonomy. It will be the reference for not only for Europe, but the whole world. It will tell you 
whether you fit or you don't fit into some parameters or not. It will decide whether a fund can be considered to be green or not. It will d d enable a lot of money. Yeah? I tell you more, talking to some investors, they told me, okay, we are putting a branch here in Europe because we think we are, you are a little bit more advanced. And I think we don't have to miss this opportunity. Yeah. For other areas, I think we don't have necessarily this uh, competitive advantage, but uh, we are at the same front. Uh, I leave it for the moment yeah, to give other colleagues the opportunity to talk, but I would st strike out the taxonomy is a key issue that will enable a lot of money and startups and funding uh, that will come in Europe and others will come with the way. I, I just want to kind of add to that. So, like, I, you know, now with my startup hat in terms of experience. So, you know, I started in December, um, started recruiting my team around January. Um, we'll be a team of 20 by the end of the year. And our VP sustainability has been around for like a month, right? And in a month, he has gotten, I don't know, like, I think four different investor requests to fill out, um, you know, ESG certification um, audits. He's gotten something like, 14, if I'm not mistaken, requests from clients. So we're, we're, we, we do mostly enterprise. There's a bit of a company that does um, more like long tail uh, uh, SMB, but really mostly enterprise. And all of them have been asking um, for a lot of a lot of different um, um, like data and information on sustainability in order to close or to renew a deal. Um, and then, you know, another interesting sign is, so I've been recruiting for my team, right? Like we, we've been, like we just closed a VP philanthropy, a VP sustainability, looking for director of impact operations, those types of roles. And it's really interesting to see the American CVs versus the European CVs and to be able to actually speak to them in interviews because something that you'll see is that most of the Europeans are conditioned to some of the more sort of like hardcore regulatory and also um, upcoming standards, they're much more aware of it and their sort of standards are very high. Whereas when you're working with um, American talent that's looking at this, what they'll be looking at more are things like ESG disclosures pre-IPO, like SASB and those kind of things, which if you look at them are actually pretty light, like super lightweight uh, compared to the sort of things that are coming um, out of Europe. So yes, definitely I would back that 100%. I think these are trends that you need to follow and then as, um, you know, as you, Europe shapes it, both at a national and certainly at a European level. If you have the opportunity to be part of the conversations and the consultations that are shaping um, you know, these regulations and these standards and these directives and so on, I uh, definitely encourage you to, to join in. Well, let me ask Massimo, you mentioned the importance of narrative and of boards. Presumably these things like identifying the sustainability goals is part of that. Yeah, sure. Um, the, p the point is that m at times too much uh, in terms of that there is a lot of greenwashing um, going out there and uh, uh, it, it has to be part of the narrative but also the reality and the point is that one of the things that I wouldn't say irritates me the most uh, but uh, I agree with this that right now is really a great point in time to raise um, because of what you just said and I think that the, the difficult part is going to be in two years when people have deployed and let's see how much capital they raise but the point where I wanted to go is there is a different one is that when we talk about sustainability yes there is that much you can do in terms of sustainability with software um, but you need to deploy new steel on the ground and new facilities and there is a huge still huge allergy from investor, as soon as you come and you have a capex, say, mm, yeah, you, you know, we really want sustainability, we really want deep tech, but can you make deep tech without deploying capex? And the answer is no. Um, and, and I think we really need to find a way to address this point because we can have all the carbon capture trading system of the world, but if we continue to emit it, then it's gonna be so really looking at deep tech as a hardware component that needs to be factored in and we need to start looking and find a reasonable way of doing it. And right now, the narrative about sustainability is there, but the reality is you come and let's put some steel in the ground and people say no. Ramon, let me ask you, um, where do corporates fit into the picture? This was something I know that you, you have looked at. Corporates fit into the picture on many grounds. First, it's their own interest to, to push more open innovation. Okay? It's for their survival and long term that they are able in one way or the other to include new elements into their um, 
business structure in order to, to, to get the dynamism they need and not to, to remain uh, rooted in what they have done so far. It's important for startups, scale-ups and others because they make you accelerate quicker. Yeah? Normally we see, and this is depending on the sectors more or less pronounced, that you, you, you it goes quicker. So for example, very clear is the situation on the pharmaceutical areas that if you have the whole routes in order to make the clinical trials, it goes far quicker. And if you are a small uh, uh, scaler, it's difficult, but if you have a big partner on hand, it gets far quicker. So it's a one-to-one -one, uh, win-win situation. And it fits also with the governmental bank, uh, um, governmental uh, corporates, even though normally they invest a little bit earlier. If you have them on board before, the trust relationship in order to invest in your region, in your nation, increases as well. So we have to increase the triangle between the three parts. Yeah, so I'd like to get your take on that in terms of what sort of approach a scale-up might take, whether it's a corporate or a government-backed. I mean, it's... Oh, I think it's very different depending on what kind of company you are, but maybe it's just to, to add to um, uh, what Ramon just said. Let's talk about exits also, right? Like, I mean, we're, we're talking about open innovation and shared R&D and all those things, which are great. But I think that one of the challenges that we're facing with corporates really as an ecosystem overall, deep tech or not, is that Europe's e exit market is just frankly terrible. Um, and uh, and that's a huge problem for you know public ins investors um, you know like the European Innovation uh, Council because essentially you're like seeding you know a, a lot of you know a, a lot of trees that eventually are going to be harvested uh, by uh, completely foreign markets and you have and we're also talking about deep tech and when we talk about deep tech that means we're talking about you know, we're, we're talking about sustainability, we're talking about energy, we're talking about um, you know, climate and so on. Uh, there's a massive sovereignty component as well, which makes the exit market even more important. So, so I think like, you know, it's like CVCs and all that, that's cool. But I think really where we need corporates to, to really be stepping up here is in terms of actually being a little bit more, a um, little bit more proactive, a little bit more aggressive in the, uh, in the market. And not, just, uh, and, and not just corporates, right, in the sort of way that we think about them, sort of older companies. Scale-ups, I think, have, uh, and, and you know, that's something we think about quite a lot at Content Square. We, as, uh, you know, once you've reached a certain scale, it's also about consolidating your market in Europe, right? If you want to become a, a, like a proper European champion, but also be able to create these sort of positive synergies and sort of give back to the ecosystem. Um, so I think uh, uh, quite a bit of that is important as well. Thais, would you like to build on that? Actually, I, I have a question for Kat on that. Um, do, you, do you think the exit market in Europe is worse because um, the startup uh, funnel is worse? Or do you, you know, where do you think the problem comes from? Well, no, because then they would be acquiring American companies, right? If you think about it, because it's not like they're acquiring. I think uh, in, in terms of you know acquisitions, you're seeing a, a bit of both. But I mean, I if you if you look at if we were sort of th to map just like the corporate history of open innovation over the last few years, which is a fun thing to do, because right now we have VivaTech, and you know, um, for those of you who, who don't know VivaTech, VivaTech is like one of the biggest sort of startup corporate um, events, or the biggest startup corporate event in Europe, um, at least today. And I remember the first years of VivaTech, they were like selling hackathons, you know? Do you remember this? You would, you would know like these corporate hackathons where startups would be asked to come, and if you won, you got an iPad or something like that, right? And that used to be acceptable, remember? And then, and then, like a, you know, a year after that, they started doing these sort of like you know branded incubators where you know nothing would happen, but you know you'd have executive committees come in and like take photos of themselves all the time with so startups, right? Um, and then you know progressively you started getting into the uh, the stage, and I'm talking like just really like four or five years ago of POCs. You know, where essentially startups would be able to sign these POCs for under 25k, and then you know, and then get into this like very long sales cycle and never hear from their clients again, or never never be able to close. And then you got into the stage of CVCs, right, which became super trendy at some point, um, and it were structured in weird ways. And then now you're getting into a point where you know they're starting to build out like proper M&A um, uh, capabilities, learning a little bit more about um, you know the actual uh, things with integration. But I think a lot of it really has to do with that maturity curve. Um, where we 
have a bit of a gap, I think, in Europe. I, I, mean, I don't know if this has been your experience as well. No, uh, absolutely. I think uh, I deeply believe that the future of deep tech and, and the industrial space in Europe is going to be uh, lagging what has happened in biopharma, where in biopharma is constant. The, the old innovation has been outsourced to startup, and there are mechanisms in place with clear role. Innovation is done there. We do go to market and production, and we're going to need to get there, but we are so far away, and as long as we don't unlock that bottleneck, we're going to continue to lag behind the U.S., which are way more aggressive when it comes in terms of company being able to invest and push forward and so on. The, the European corporate are extremely conservative when it comes to that. They really don't want to change, and this really needs to change. This is, for me, one of uh, the very, very, very important things that needs to be addressed. Uh, one investor with whom we spoke is, so forget about all the other stuff and so on. The real big problem for deep tech in Europe are corporates, partner. Well, I have a very general question I want to get all of your thoughts on, which is how important is a European mindset at the scale-up stage? Is it important to think European or should we be thinking globally? Is, is there something there that's either an advantage or a disadvantage, Kat? Um, so, like, if I if I take my you know the company right now, or uh, if I make again, I, I have this sort of like dissonance where I'm both thinking as you know, in, in sort of like a former French government official and someone who is you know in in in, in a very competitive company right now. Um, I think there are a couple, right? Like, and 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 I remember when I was in um, in French tech, there was always this debate on what makes a French company really, right? Like, what does it mean to focus on France? At the end of the day, we were pretty chill about it. We are like, okay, you just need to be headquartered in France, and you know, we don't care where your sales teams are, where you're growing, as long as you're headquartered in France and your R&D is in France, everything else we don't really care about as much, right? Um, and uh, and so, you know, contrary to a lot of uh, different European com uh, countries, by the way, f I think that's actually a definition that I, I used to think was pretty general, but actually it's not, because a lot of European companies uh, countries define uh, their national companies in a completely different way. Some of them will say like, oh, it's okay if you know they went to Y Combinator and they're like officially headquartered in Delaware as long as the first capital came from here. Or it's okay as long as the founders, um, you know, are from, uh, you know, are from our country and so on. And, and the truth is like w we're we're massively headquartered in in Paris, right? About 600, 700 people based in Paris uh, out of like a company of roughly 1,600. Our R&D is mostly um, in based in Paris, like the product house is based mostly in Paris, um, and a bit in Barcelona, and then via an acquisition a little bit in, in Tel Aviv. But when we scale, it's mostly the sales offices that are scaling. So all of that firepower um, is is going elsewhere. But we're the heart of it is still um, is still in Paris is still in Paris. So I mean, I'm guessing like you know what I would say in terms of European is. Uh, and again, like I, I can't tell if it's my startup hat or my my government hat is talking. I think there's a sort of just a sort of a sense of loyalty and giving back. Like the question is, what ecosystem are you part of, and what do you want to give back to? Because you're not just talking about the stable company as it grows, right? Like if I, you know, the what makes an ecosystem strong is eventually got what it's not what it has, but what gets reinjected into it. Um, you know, when you have an exit of some kind, for example, is the capital going back into it? Is the talent going back into it? Is all of the experience and, and you know, uh, the, you know, the angel funding experience founders is it going back into it? And I think when I think of like what makes a European company, I think it's just companies that are committed to making sure that that cycle, um, you know, keeps on progressing as opposed to companies that say like fence out their borders and say we're not going to do these things in other geographies because most of our business is actually um, currently growing the fastest in uh, outside of Europe right like mostly in the US one one important addition from from my side is apart from the pain of having invested and trying to grow companies in Italy, but that's a whole different story. Uh, so location matters uh, when it comes to startup. But I, I think the one thing that we all need to acknowledge where we're here. There is a fundamental intrinsic geopolitical component to deep tech that we cannot think away and we really need to consider. And you're seeing how the current crisis is the supply chain, energy, all of the things, all are linked back to deep tech. And the same way that mm, the, uh, the uh, Department of Defense is now looking at climate change as a strategic issue in the US, we should start looking at deep tech as a really a very important geopolitical dimension that we need to nurture and, and, and support because it's going to really uh, determine the fate uh, of, of our civilization. I mean, I, I'm not uh, overstating this. I, I really deeply believe in that. About the mindset, I think that's also why I asked the question, do you, do you think it's the 
the exit market problems first, or do you think it's the, the startup funnel first? What, what I'm seeing is that there's a lot of successful startups coming out now in Europe, and this is changing a little bit the, the mindset, the ecosystem. You have uh, TransferWise, you have Skype, you have Farfetch, you have UiPath. And what I'm seeing, this happened in the US earlier, and this is why the exit market in the US is so good. And I'm hoping that with these success stories, and with more of these success stories coming, that's why these EIC Scale Up 100 and Scale Up 50 initiatives are so important. Um, I hope that this mindset is also coming to Europe, that the exit market will improve, and um, that also the entrepreneurial mindset is coming. And I, I'm starting to sense it. A lot of people at universities, uh, we're recruiting a lot, and uh, a lot of people at universities, they want to be entrepreneurs. And this is not something that I saw before. Basically, the question is, is diverse, diversity an advantage or a disadvantage? Right now, I would say it's rather a disadvantage. But I think it can be turned into an advantage. The problem I see, in one, one of the problems I see, and I ha we can prove this, is cross-border investments hardly occur. Okay. Normally, French investors invest in France. German ones, at the maximum, they do it in, in Austria, in, 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 in Switzerland. And there are exceptions, notable exceptions. But the tendency is that. Or if you go out, you normally you go out over the Atlantic. I think what we should be creating something like, <laughs> let's put it bluntly, something like an Erasmus for, for the whole area. Erasmus stopped the brain drain to the United States by a brain circulation within Europe. Something similar we have to, 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 to achieve here, that we have a, a, a market area that everybody knows who is doing what, and we build a trust that we invest, <laughs> let's say, into Italians when you know who they are, yeah, even if you are abroad. And if we manage this, this, this diversity becomes an advantage. Well, we're going to hear um, a little bit later on, we're going to hear pitches. We're also going to hear about this new call. And I would like each of you to perhaps, if you could distill a little piece of advice for the potential applicants to this call. If you can give in, you know, in, in, in one or two minutes what they should really hold in their minds as they think about this. Kat, I'll allow you to go first. So we're talking about which call? The call, like the... The scale up. Of course. All right, all right. I just want to be absolutely sure. Um, so. I, I believe in, in programs like this. You know, I, I've set some up, I've run them. There was a tremendous amount of skepticism in the beginning. In France, we set up something called um, the Next 40 or the French Tech 120. And everyone was like, what can government do for us? It's going to be totally useless. And I can tell you that, you know, the retention rates and the sort of overall kind of like NPS scores have been very high. Um, and I think it's, a, it's an approach that really allows both, you know, both to learn. And as the EIC, you know, as the EIC does this, um, you know, I think, the goal here is to really be able to unlock what is it that you know um, governments. You know, I don't know how much you've actually looked into um, in the overall pitch, but essentially you have everything from um, you know support navigating the complexities of procurement um, at, at an EU level. Uh, there's something that's really cool about the um, EIC, uh, the EIC Scale Up 100 program is particularly the market entry support program. So there's like these mul multilateral um, you know uh, deals that have been signed um, through the European Startup Nations Alliance that essentially will make it easier to go to market in different geographies inside Europe. So I would definitely um, um, encourage you to, to go for that. Uh, contrary to all of the some of the limits that were built into some of the programs that I designed in the past, this program was designed to be quite open, actually. So there aren't a lot of uh, constraining requirements to be able to, to, to be able to apply. So I think like definitely, I mean, for, for those of you who are thinking about it, wondering about it, I think you should definitely go for it, not just from a service perspective, but because, and this is my experience working with programs in the past, it allows you to be part of some very important conversations um, that are happening at the, at the European level where you get tagged immediately as, you know, people that could eventually be spokespersons or, or people that could really like weigh into some of the sort of regulation that's being built at the time. So, you know, encourage you 100%. Massimo. I would say it's so difficult to scale up in Europe. Ultimately, when you're moving to tickets that are above 20 million, uh, there are not that many alternatives. There are a bunch of funds that can really go and lead. So I think this is the best shot that one can have to really seriously scale up. And uh, in all transparency, when I started out, how much can we 
help these companies. Um, but I was really impressed to see how much value can be created in the process, working on the stuff that we have said. So I would definitely recommend to do it um, because it's really, really important. And this is the most difficult thing. Um, as I love to, to say, uh, you know, a lot of people are looking for unicorns, but in, uh, in Europe, ducklings uh, that are really beautiful swans that have not realized yet that they are swans. Uh, so go to the mirror, look, realize you're a swan, apply and become one. Yeah, I think uh, so the Scale Up 100 call, it's, it's a call for um, support organizations to help the most promising Series B and beyond uh, companies in Europe to, to scale up to the next level. I think there's a lot that can be done to help these companies. Uh, to, to raise funding, it's extremely time consuming. Founders get very distracted. They should be able to focus on their product, their clients, but they can't. They need to, they need to scale up. And uh, there's a lot that organizations can do to help founders. Um, good boards, making these boards is a, is a huge differentiator. They need to be investor ready. Uh, they need to have the right narrative. Uh, and there's a lot of time that can be saved for these organizations. And also one that I really like is, you know, the, the thing investors care about the most is sales, traction. These companies that are getting a product to market and the product is getting somewhere, if, if these organizations are able to make good connections with the corporate world, um, this is going to be a huge differentiator for the founders. Mm, in the slide I showed you before, I showed that the pilot worked so i have no doubt this program would work will work as well and i i, I think it's fantastic that it helps big uh, scale up and i hope in the future it will be done as well and as a public uh, um, authorization i can nothing else than wish you a lot of luck <laughs> well thank you and then i'm going to ask for one word from each of you uh, starting <laughs> start at this end, Ramon, how optimistic are you about the future of European scale-ups and innovation? I'm very optimistic. I think <laughs> we have succeeded in Europe in the last 10 years to ramp up and make a maturity in all levels of venture capital, in startups, and, and, and which was unprecedented before. Think about that the United States started with the SPIC program in the 50s, yeah, and then and and they have far more. Uh, uh, um, uh, it's more in in their um, history to done it, and we have catched up relatively quick. We have done this with all the problems we had, but I'm confident it will be even Im improving in the future. The problem I still mm. see is the regional differences between countries and within the countries themselves within the regions. But we think we will fall. We, we, we manage. Please, how optimistic are you? I'm, I'm also very optimistic. I hope I continue to see the changes that are happening at a European level. Um, a lot of the programs were very hard for companies, you know, with consortiums, many different IP owners. And this is changing with the EIC, where you have one company, one IP owner. Um, I think Europe has the talent. Um, we have the market, although it's very dispersed, but it's it's all moving in the right direction. And um, I hope the investors in this room, they can take the brochure, check out the companies that are here today. And you can see there's a lot of, um, it, it's like a gold mine of investment opportunities. All these companies, they receive grant money, non-dilutive. They can really develop their products far. And you see amazing examples of, of great companies coming through the funnel. Uh, so I'm very optimistic. And of course, don't forget to use the app to set up one-on-one -on -one meetings with the companies. Massimo, optimistic, pessimistic, somewhere in between? I, I'm optimistic by nature. Um, it's not going to be easy. Um, I mean, we would be lying if we say, would be saying something different. But uh, in the longer term, uh, definitely optimistic because the potential is there. We have a time issue. Uh, we don't have that much time, both for the planet, uh, but also in terms of capital markets. And Kat, final word to you. Uh, Either terrify us or inspire us. 
Whoa. <laughs> I mean, definitely optimistic. Um, you know, if only because I actually got my French citizenship just a few months ago, so now I have no choice. Um, <laughs> but no, I mean, you know, when when I um, when I started in French Tech, it was in 2018, and we had three unicorns, and the president said we're going to have 25 by 2025, and everyone thought he was crazy. Um, and you know, today I don't even you know we don't even count anymore. It's become uncool to count unicorns. Actually, you know, um, I remember when uh, when um, um, Xavier Niel created Station F, which is you know Europe's biggest startup campus, and he said you know that was around 2016, 2017, and he said we're gonna have a, have a thousand companies inside here, and everyone was like, you're crazy. We don't even have a thousand companies in France. And today, you know, like the, the, the lines are still filling up. I remember when Lisbon decided to say, okay, we're going to become one of the startup capitals of Europe. You're like, look, you're like kind of sinking in unemployment. This is never going to happen. And today it's attracting talent from all over the world. Um, you know, these are all like these incredible and inspiring stories, uh, you know, across the ecosystem. But something that they all have in common is that they have ecosystems that care. Right, uh, like we're optimistic, but I think you know, for those of us that have taken part in this, we know how hard it was. We know how much coordination it took, how much like you know, g sort of genuine love, investment, and teamwork. So I'm I'm optimistic in the sense that I'm seeing the pieces move in that direction. But you know, let's not take for granted this is like this is not a natural momentum thing, right? This is not like we're going to sit back and relax and it's going to happen. It's going to be tremendously difficult, and it's going to take really like a lot of constant pushing, and nobody ever at any point really kind of letting their guard down, and then and then, then I think we'll make it. And, and one thing, um, we always get the LPs in all discussion, and they are so important because I think they are doing what is in their uh, LP agreement. Um, so we should really include them into all of this discussion because it's not that the investor are there and they don't want to do it. Sometimes they want to do it, but cannot do it. So LP education is also a very important part of this transition. Thank you. Yes. Well, please, that's uh, the end of our panel section, but uh, we do have some more tidbits coming up. So please, a big warm round of applause for our speakers. Well, I think we've, we've covered a lot of very broad areas in that discussion, but we are going to narrow in our focus now on the EIC Scaling Up 100. Now, we've seen Scale Up 30 already in progress. In fact, 37 companies. Uh, Peace said it here on the stage that VOL Pekka opened his eyes. So VOL, uh, EIC Business Acceleration Services and Transition Head of Unit, please open all our eyes and tell us a lot about the Scale Up 100. Paris, and what's uh, more pleasurable is to be in Paris. Um, is like I was saying that it's uh, always a pleasure to be in Paris, and what's even more pleasurable is to be in Paris and to talk about a very exciting topic uh, like scaling up. For me, um, I, I just to make the link with the last question, I'm, I'm also very optimistic. I remember in 2011 when with uh, Isidro and Bogdan and some colleagues we were launching Startup Europe, the situation was completely different. And the situation now, uh, I think nobody would say that uh, Europe has uh, such a big problem with startups. We are now uh, putting our eyes on the next phase. So I'm sure I'm, I'm optimistic that in, in the next years, the situation will, will improve. And I think it's already on the way to go. So um, if we can go to the next slide, please, or actually I have it here. So. It's good that it's uh, such, a small, uh, such a small room, so please um, feel free to ask questions. You can also uh, point your browser to, uh, to Slido to uh, scale up your EU hashtag. Um, we'll start a bit, um, if you want, with, uh, with setting the scene, also um, building on what has uh, been already said and trying not to repeat. Um, also uh, moving a bit on to impact so that we as they say, start with the end in mind and then going a bit more into details, um, very important for uh, the one of you that want to, to apply. So I think it um, was, was very interesting said that, uh, you know, we really need to, um, to invest in, uh, in deep tech uh, startup and to scale them up to remain a global innovation leader. Today we are, we are talking about uh, geopolitics of technology, uh, we are talking about technology sovereignty. This is all linked with having deep tech uh, 
companies that are solid that can deploy this. Um, I think uh, the announcement this morning was also a very good uh, demonstration of why it's important for, for, to main, for Euro prosperity to scale uh, these um, uh, deep tech startups. If you remember the, uh, the CEO just uh, announced that, you know, from zero to I think 120, 100 plus uh, jobs uh, in, in a very short time. So um, the statistics and the, st and the research is clear with the amount and percentage of, uh, of new jobs that are created by uh, startup and scale-up company. And last but not least, um, we clearly have in Europe and, either, and, and obviously in the world um, challenge in terms of uh, green transition and for sure for Europe we, all, we also have the digital transition. So these are uh, just very few reasons why we need to address the scaling up uh, issue in Europe. Now, I think we are, we, are, we are starting from a good foundation. Let me put it, you see here some, some progress in terms of uh, figures, and I see there is some, uh, some issue with the, uh, there, but it is clear that at the scaling up phase, and, and I think Massimo mentioned as well, it is still very hard uh, in Europe to raise 20 plus 20 million, 20 plus million uh, funds. That is, uh, that is quite, uh, quite clear. In the same time, I, um, I think that at the, at the startup phase, Europe is more or less at par with the US. I think in the latest Atomico report, we are talking about 35% of um, less than 5 million rounds raised in the US and 33 in Europe. So it is almost there. We're almost there. Um, the, the rich um, but poorly in interconnected ecosystem was mentioned also in the previous, um, in the previous uh, by previous speakers. Uh, investment happening mostly within the borders. Uh, another point which I think it was not mentioned is this r lack of role models. I think the European VCs, the European uh, CEOs, need to be a bit more inspired that they need to the patience to, to scale up and really, um, you know, become, um, become also in their turn role models for the other CEO. I think now if we, if we, are, looking, if we are moving to wha what, let's say, at the end of this um, action, what do we want to see? I think if we, can if we can put it in one sentence, we want to see that the supported company um, are positioned as a successful and fast-growing company. So really, that's the kind of capture in one sentence. How to do it? Well, we want to see improved networking, obviously. I think that's, that's, a, um, that's a very, very important part. It's not only the risk uh, capital. That's for sure we want it. It will be needed. European equity needs to to be uh, deployed uh, in, in, in the supported company. And then um, I think when you scale up, uh, we need to, you need to improve the knowledge, the skills, the talent, and the operational excellence. So these are all a few of the, let's say, the, the impacts that we want to see at the end of this project, at the end of this action. Uh, you see also here a, a bit the differences what the, between the current pilot in and the scale up 100. It's a, it's a clear increase in the ambition that we want to see. Um, for the first time, we, will, we want to have, we will have both the EIC companies from the one that we supported across the years, but also from the member states and from other European program. And then, again, broader scope of support. So not only um, support to attract uh, and raise capital, but also to um, uh, tackle other pain points when uh, you are scaling up. Now, what we, in the, in the work program, we have put some illustrative examples, okay? And I think that is just some examples that we thought that are a bit obvious in terms of increased funding. We've seen it also in the previous session. It's still difficult to raise higher amounts of funding, but also for business development, for internationalization, soft landing, um, corporates, uh, dealing, doing business with corporates, and of course also some training, mentoring, and coaching in order to improve the operational excellence. Um, what we also want to see some peer le learning exchange of best practices. And this, all the upper part refer to the support to the company. Um, 
I think also in order to improve the whole situation in Europe, we would like also to see some uh, feedback and support to the ecosystem. We'd like to see uh, a scale-up report in order to put the issue more in the public opinion and to, sh to show some facts and figures and key trends. I think that will be an important deliverable and, and uh, legacy also to, s to, s to follow the progress and to track the progress. <coughs> also would like to see the feedback and recommendation to the member states and even at the EU level. And here I think it's important to link with existing initiative a bit more details in the next, uh, in the next slide. Now, we said scale up 100. So basically there will be um, 50 companies from EIC and 15 companies from outside the EIC beneficiary from the member states program, from the other European program like uh, Digital Europe program, EIT, and so on and so on. Okay, so we put some small differences, but um, the idea is to have uh, parity between, between these sources. And obviously, once uh, these companies are selected, they kind of become uh, are treated similar to the EIC beneficiary and access to all the business acceleration services. Um, I think there are two or there are two or three important, I would say, success factors for you as an applicant to keep in mind. First, I would say, is the methodology to identify the participant company. Actually, this is this is critical, uh, and it's also sensitive because you can imagine that a lot of people will look at this methodology. Okay, and obviously the evaluators will <laughs> look at your proposal. What, what do you propose? Uh, I remember when we were discussing with Ramon and said, "Viorel, uh, we haven't, uh, we are not aware of a sort of a." Uh, quantitative or, or automatic methodology to identify the next unicorns, okay? Because otherwise uh, the things would be much simpler. So this should be your secret sauce and you should convincingly, uh, you should demo demonstrate this convincingly to the evaluators uh, why you, uh, your method is, is the best. And then the other methodology that I would say it's a, it's a, it's a critical success factor for your proposal would be methodology to support the selected company. Okay, so first, how do you select a company? And then, once you have selected, how do you support? And again, you should uh, explain this uh, convincingly and, uh, and why you uh, propose, what are the measures, of course, beyond access to finance and so on and so on. And then I would say the third uh, success factor would be the, um, the implementation, you know, why you have the, you, why you sh should be selected, uh, what's your differentiator, why you and why not the other proposal. So that would be the, um, I would say, the very important aspects when you are thinking and are writing your proposal. Now, it's very important because um, there will be uh, companies from outside the EIC and you remember the feedback to policy. It's very important to, be a, to, to make the link and not to do and collaborate with the other existing uh, initiative. First, with the national and uh, other uh, European innovation programs here, and I think um, the previous speakers alluded to some of these initiatives, um, and including here the, um, the, the Europe Startup Nations Alliance, the, the standards and, and the recommendation that you found, and it's very important to have the link with them because um, it's, it's, it would be silly to duplicate. Uh, and then um, the EIC Forum, that's also another um, let's say interface to which to communicate the, the recommendation to uh, to the member states, and uh, I think uh, Ramon also mentioned um, the, um, the fragmentation that exists in Europe. And I think this is this is uh, I see this as an as a area with a high potential. If we improve and we reduce these uh, these um, disparities, I think that they will be better for for all the scale ups in in Europe. Um, and there are many of them, We obviously EIB, EIF, and, and so on. I think it's very important to be aware about the whole ecosystem and to make this link not, not overlap. Um, perhaps one uh, last point which I forget, the EIC business acceleration services. Again, obviously uh, the EIC beneficiary, they benefit, they, they already can, can apply, and then the 50 others, when they, they also become eligible. And for example, um, when on the business acceleration services, actually, we are, as, as I speak, uh, my, colleague, my colleagues are in, in, at Bio in, in, uh, in San Diego bringing 20 uh, of the EIC beneficiary. Um, it, it makes sense 
to take this into account. We, have, we, will pub we are publishing our program for the next year and, and so on and so on. So it makes sense to, to not to try to duplicate this kind of initiatives. The same, uh, I'm thinking with corporates. We have a very successful uh, program for corporates. We are doing at least, uh, on average, uh, one corporate day uh, or multi-corporate day per month, and we are increasing this rhythm. Again, it makes sense to collaborate rather than try to, to, to duplicate. Um, even more practicalities. So, like always, uh, the, uh, Euro the European uh, the participant portal, or, uh, or as we call it, now, as it's called now, funding and tenders portal, is your way to go. There you find all the documents that you need uh, to apply. So all is electronic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, this is a, a CSA, so a coordination and support action. It means you can apply everything from a mono beneficiary to a consortium. Up to you to, to decide, provided you have all the competencies that that you need. Obviously, there are a few eligibility with respect to you need to be. Um, <coughs> EU uh, member states or associated country, and so on and so on. And if you want um, to find partners, um, you, there is a search function there, but also we, have, uh, we are supporting a wide network of national contact points, and my advice is to contact them as well. Um, the budget, very important. Uh, I think it's for a CSA, and not only, it's a very ambitious budget, seven million. Um, because we wanted to make sure that the budget will be enough to uh, ensure proper support. In terms of duration, somehow in the work program is not mentioned, but our uh, clear intention was to have a three plus year, what means that we should have around three years of support to the company and uh, a month uh, in the beginning and the end for startup and winding down activities. Okay, so please take this in, in, into account. Um, it's, it's, a, it's orientation there. Um, I think that's, that was, yeah, not this is the last slide. So you see the main uh, timelines that, uh, that, we, that, uh, that we have uh, with the power of proposal and so on and so on. We could do a bit uh, better than this, uh, but also um, the whole idea of how we position and time in this is to kind, not to overlap, but to continue with the current pilot, okay? So that that's, that would be also one of the considerations that we are taking into uh, into account. But the important uh, the important date to to keep in mind is fifth of October um, at uh, five p.m. Brussels time Brussels time. But obviously, my advice is do not wait on the last minute. You never know a technical glitch or or whatever. I think the time was was more than enough to to prepare the proposal in, in well in advance. And um, also through the NCPs, if you have any question, uh, you can ask the NCPs and then if they don't know, then of course they, uh, they, know, uh, they know our address. That was it for myself and uh, if there are any, I think now we will have a few questions or the possibility to ask a few questions. Over to you. Thank you, Virel. Absolutely, we have the Slido app there as you can see. On the screen, you can go to slido.com or sli.go, put in the hashtag ScaleUpEU and put your questions. Um, we also have mics here in the room, should we need to. Um, right, I'm, I'm seeing quite a lot of questions coming in already. So, first of all, let's, let's ask this first one. Can the action last longer than three years? It might be difficult to come up with the expected impact in such a short time. Um, thank you very much. Um, actually, this is the reason why, because initially we were thinking about a shorter distance. I say, no, 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 you need time. You need time to achieve the impact. You cannot just uh, scale a company uh, and, and achieve a unicorn or, or, or in the neighborhood in, in one or two years. Uh, so I would say, the, um, I will be honest, uh, in, the legal, in, the, in the legal text, in other words, in the work program, there is no uh, duration. So you can, uh, you can have it uh, more than three years. Um, I, I would say four years perhaps would be a bit too, too much, but I would say between the three and, and four years. So that's, that's my recommendation. But legally, you can, you can have definitely longer than three years. Okay, I should also note that we have got polls on Slido that we can run in the background if you want to navigate to those. We'll take a look at them in a moment. But we have another question. The action is open to up to 50 companies, far more supported by other programs at the EU member states and associated countries. Can you tell us more about suitable programs? 
Well, I think here we are flexible. What is important is, uh, I mean, the, the, 50, the 50 companies from EIC, that's, that's quite clear. Ac uh, across the year, we have supported between five and 6,000 companies. Uh, so they, this will be the 50, uh, the, will make the pool of eligible beneficiary for the 51 from, uh, from EIC. On the rest, we realize there is a very, well, as the slide was saying, uh, fra fragmented situation out there. Certain member states, they have programs. We have, we have heard of some of them. Some others do not have, uh, but, but, they, but they even, they, but they do have unicorns. So I think it's not necessary to be supported by a national, by a national program to be eligible, provided that there are certain uh, criteria that are, that are met. But otherwise, any program that is more or less of official, a French tech, it was one example that was mentioned before, uh, but I think many countries have these support programs, okay? So it's not, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not a must, but I think we'll somehow facilitate the communication and, of course, the pre-screening. the pre -screening. And, of course, there are some European programs like, like DEP, and I think the, 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 the announcement this morning was uh, such, a, such an example. We have also a question asking whether the companies can come from only one program. I suppose that means can they have more than one program that they're involved with? Of course, of course, of course. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> um, Marie gets right to the point. Uh, how much money will be granted to the selected companies? An excellent question. Um, from the amount of the, of the project, there will not be any money awarded to the companies themselves. Uh, this, uh, this, is, uh, this is not uh, third-party financing. The, the, the budget will go to the, to the consortium to make sure that the companies will be, the 100 companies, quite a big number, will be well supported. You need to scale up. You, you don't need uh, 50K or 60K or, or, or whatever you can get. No, the, there won't be direct money going to the, to the supported companies. They will receive services and support. And what stage do the startups have to be at? For example, is it Series A or B or pre-revenue? Yes, indeed. The, the, um, the work program says very clear they have to be ready for the B+. plus. So it means they already have to invest to receive a, a, a Series A uh, investment. That already gives you a hint about the, 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 the methodology to, to select them, for example. Okay, now I think uh, we have also a Slido poll that we can launch now. We'll get some questions for our audience as well as questions from them. Do we have that that we can show? Yes. So the question is, what kind of non-financial support do European scalers need the most? Uh, I think that's a good point to raise that when yes. we've just had the questions there Very on how much money. Question. So that's a, an open option for you. Just type in whatever you think. The, well, we see there networking, <laughs> recruiting, and so on. I'll come back and have a look at that in just a moment because we'll go back to our other questions that we see. So, in fact, in terms of networking, uh, another question is what kind of networking events should the consortium implement? Well, well I, I think it's, um, it's a wide term and, again, we led to your, uh, to your uh, deep expertise in, in scaling up and understanding their, their needs. Uh, obviously, uh, networking with, with um, I would say, uh, successful, uh, the CEO of successful uh, companies that scale up so that they understand a bit uh, what are the pains and, and, and some, some best practice, some tricks, uh, tip and tricks, if I may say so. That's one idea. Uh, but also um, potential, uh, potential customers. Uh, there are other, other uh, networking um, ideas. Um, but oh, we, we put this and we understand it's a broad, it's a broad um, scope, so this leaves you the opportunity to, um, to deploy your, your deep expertise, basically. A question asking you, can you tell us more about the application itself? Is it similar to the full proposal for the EIC accelerator? Mm, very good question. Uh, thank you. Uh, it is not similar at all. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if it's good or bad, but we are we are not have several stages. There is only one uh, submission. Um, there is not a short proposal. There is not a long proposal, and there is not even a jury phase. So it's just. Um, I think the, the evaluation process is described in the, in the annexes. You will submit your proposals. Uh, at, after that, we will uh, have a, a remote phase. 
um, with, I think, three or four experts, and after that we'll have consensus and, and the ranking list, and that's it. Another question is, who can be part of the consortium that should provide services to the 100 companies? Well, the, eligibility, the, the slide on eligibility was, was there. So first of all, the CSA allows also mono beneficiaries. So that's, that's up to you to, uh, to decide. And then obviously, uh, there are certain uh, requirements with respect to the uh, nationality. Uh, it has to be from the, from the EU or from associated countries. There are possibilities to have partners from um, non-EU or non-associated countries. Um, uh, for example, uh, even from UK and uh, Switzerland, then they are associated partners with their own financing, um, and then uh, even if from the US, but then the, um, they will whether have to be uh, with their own money or the jury, uh, the experts will have to uh, assess that they are essential for the success of the action and recommend financing. I'm going to take a look. I I'm aware that you can see them on the big screen here as well, but some of the non-financial support that people are asking for are co-investor sessions, pitching their companies, keys to enter or scale up in the US and Asian markets, uh, TED at EIC, I suppose that's a sort of an event, yeah. an event at the parliament, narrative market entry support, contacts to investors, the need to create an entrepreneurial mindset shift, leadership and scale-up capabilities, introductions to investors, talent recruiting and networking. So quite a lot of wide and varied things there that we see people calling for. Perhaps one, one aspect, I think the, the work program did mention about uh, bespoke package, about agile and so on and so on. So I think it's important and, and you know, two, three, year, three years or three years plus should allow enough time to do this. So I think you need to look a bit at, 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 uh, at the portfolio of 100 and companies. Obviously, company by company may, 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 may be too much and overkill, but at least try to group them and to say, okay, at this stage, for this group of company, these one, two measures are the most efficient or the most important or will help them the most at this stage. And then they, you go for it, and after a while, a few months, whatever, you assess the, the state of play and you say, okay, now this group of companies moved uh, from this, so this becomes more urgent. Talent becomes urgent, production facilities or, or, or uh, pilot facilities, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, 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 that's a bit of a... I'm going to launch another poll. This is a multiple choice one, which is just to ask those who are following online or those here in the room, uh, do you plan to apply as an implementing entity? Yes, no, we're still thinking about it, or no, but we're not into this business. So let's put that poll up there, so please, people, do vote, and we will have a look. Uh, let's see if there's any more, actually, uh, Viorel, whether I have any more questions for you. And, oh yes, we do, of course. Um, some general questions uh, is, how shall the implementing entity select the participating companies? Um, I think I mentioned, I refer a bit in my, in my presentation, let me, so I think definitely this should be one of the components of your, let's say, secret soul. So you should explain to us um, how do you plan to do this, okay? You can go, for example, for a combination between a, a, a bit of a pre-selection and quantitative uh, uh, where you say, okay, uh, they should have a minimum size or, or like the work program mentioned already, you know, should already have raised around A and so on and so on. And then you can go for a different phase with based on experts or, or, or um, let's say some of the, the people that you are collaborating or, or completely different. It's, it's up to you. I think this is, this, this is again one of the important aspects of your proposal. Another question uh, we're seeing here is, it is impossible to achieve scale up with no funding and almost all impact funding is for companies that have significant revenues. Uh, very big question, how does EIC plan to overcome that gap? Well, definitely uh, in the accelerator we are uh, looking at, at this stage. So first of all, we have um, a pilot. Let's see if uh, how will uh, will evolve where we are. Try where we'll be able for uh, certain areas uh, of strategic interest for, for Europe to give 
more than 15 million in equity, okay? And then obviously we want to give this as a co-investor, so you can, uh, you can imagine that um, the round should be at least uh, 45, uh, 45 plus million um, extra, that, that's one thing. But also by, by the fact that we are providing a grant of up to two million and a, and a half euro plus an equity, which kind of normal can be up to 15 million, I think that's already one, one, of, the, one of the aspects that I think we are, we are doing our utmost to, uh, to support. We have a question here. Scale Up 100 aims to place between 10 and 20 companies on a sustainable path, reaching the status of a unicorn at the end of the project. What does it mean? Um, I guess it's define a unicorn, but also perhaps define what is the end of the project. Exactly. Basically, ideally, we would like, I mean, perhaps you could say, okay, um, in three years, it's very difficult or even impossible to, to have, a, to have a, a, a unicorn. Let's see. I, well, perhaps, perhaps not, but the idea is to have at least 10 to 20 companies that are almost there and that they will have a, a very high chance of becoming a unicorn in, in, the, in, the, in the next period. I think then our final question, again, another more esoteric one. How do you define deep tech? <laughs> well, I, I think uh, that, that, that question um, came before, but it's basically, it's a company that has a very um, important research base and that with a lot of scientific uh, research, with a lot of, um, let's say, uh, advanced um, with a lot of capex as well, we have seen this. Uh, we have seen this before, and even one that is putting products um, that are not uh, there, uh, not yet there, but again they are rooted in uh, deep uh, in the research uh, and um, a lot of physics, a lot of chemistry, a lot of biotechnology, AI, robotics. These are basically uh, the main fields. I liked Massimo's response to that question on the panel, which was it's more of an approach than a, than a destination, as it were. Well, thank you very much, Viral. I'm, I know you're around here for those people in the room to grab you and ask more questions. So thank you very much indeed. A big round of applause. Thank you. So we're now wrapping up this early part of our event today and our online part. So I'd like to invite up on stage to give the closing remarks. Uh, once again, please, uh, Jean-David Malo, Director of ISMIR, and also Pascal Lagarde, BPA France, Executive Director for Strategy and International Relations. Gentlemen, please take the stage. Uh, so, Jean-David, I think uh, I'll let you give us some opening thoughts for this closing part of our event, uh, what you've been inspired by and what you've heard so far. No, thanks a lot, Jennifer, and uh, thanks again uh, for, for this first part of our event, which is uh, not yet over. I mean, the certainly, the best certainly the best part is coming in reality. Um, no, uh, f some first thoughts. Um, first, uh, I just would like to, um, to, to highlight um, the fact that uh, we are at a very particular moment uh, in Europe uh, with, in fact, a lot of opportunities. I mean, we are facing a number of difficulties. Uh, I would not quote what is absolutely obvious regarding the impact uh, of uh, the return of war in Europe and the consequence on the economy. Uh, we are going over the pandemic, which has a lot of uh, issues also on, on the way we work. These are, of course, challenges, but also a lo uh, it's creating a lot of opportunity. In this context, uh, we have the chance to see more and more a vibrant ecosystem regarding um, innovation and solutions that can be brought, in fact, uh, to, um, to the challenges that we have in front of us in a number of domains that are of direct interest for our citizens, but that are also of direct interest not only at short term, but also at medium and long term. And I'm, I'm here thinking in particular of um, uh, the uh, necessity to uh, shape the uh, autonomy, the strategic autonomy of, uh, of the Union. 
Uh, and in this context, it's obvious that we have to find ways to give their chance to our innovators, to our investors, and uh, it's uh, absolutely uh, necessary to ensure that all the actors that can stimulate, in fact, this ecosystem, that can help this ecosystem, like BPI France, like the European Commission, like uh, other institutions, uh, are absolutely um, essential. And what we heard this morning, uh, with, of course, the announcement of the first investment of the, uh, of the IC fund, uh, in Cyperl, a company which, is, which would be instrumental for the uh, autonomic strategy of the Union uh, regarding chips, for example. What we heard this morning regarding the, um, uh, the uh, new initiative launched <coughs> uh, by, uh, uh, by BPI and that was uh, highlighted uh, by uh, Nicola in its uh, introductionary words this morning, what we heard regarding the uh, EIC scale-up initiative, uh, of course, the uh, closing EIC scale-up 30, but also the forthcoming EIC scale-up 100, are participating, in fact, to, to all of this, and uh, uh, it's very promising, in fact. I mean, there are only some actions, because much more has, uh, has to come. Uh, by definition, this cannot be done in isolation. I mean, this must be done in close association between the various uh, actors. And I would like on the side of, uh, of the Commission to thank uh, particularly all our partners in the context of the initiatives that uh, we are running for the time being, but also the ones that are coming up. Allow me, because we are in BPI France, to have a particular thought and a particular thank also to BPI France, because, I mean, we worked with BPI France now for years uh, in the context of the European Innovation Council, but also in the context of a number of other activities that are for the benefit of, uh, in particular, startup and SMEs. And I'm thinking of what we did in the context of Innofin or what we did in the context of the FC, I mean, the, 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 the Juncker plan. Uh, and, and, and a number of other activities where we have demonstrated that by joining our forces, in fact, we can go quicker, faster, longer, and with bigger impact. And if we have one ambition on the side of the EIC, in particular in the, on the side of the uh, uh, European Innovation Council and SME Executive Agencies to reinforce this partnership, in particular as far as uh, is investment is, um, is, uh, is concerned. Um, I, I do believe, if you, if you allow me also, that uh, uh, we should not be afraid um, to take risk. Um, and this is certainly one of the challenges that we have uh, still as far as uh, public administrations or promotional bodies uh, are concerned. Um, I was, uh, I mean, we had uh, in the past a number of bottlenecks because it's always very difficult to, to, to convince uh, decision maker or policy makers that uh, taking risk in fact uh, is in reality investing in the future uh, for a number of reasons. And I was, I mean, we have experienced this within the commission. I'm sure you have experienced this also within BPI France. But it's only by taking risks, it's only by developing also a culture of failure that uh, we can succeed. I mean, it's very rare that a startup is succeeding from the very first, uh, the very first attempt. I mean, it's after several attempts that uh, usually you are, you are succeeding because you learn from your failure. And, uh, and there we have, uh, we have to do uh, much more. Um, so, I don't want to monopolize, I mean, because I know that we have only 15 minutes, but, uh, but I know that uh, with partners like BPI France, but we have, of course, also other partners, we have the same philosophy about it, and we are really there uh, in order to support our investors, our innovators, our researchers, our engineers, our entrepreneurs, in a nutshell, uh, that are ready to take this kind of risk and to deliver on the main challenges that we have. So with this kind of event, I mean, we have exactly this kind of objective, and I'm sure that we will uh, multiply this kind of event and this kind of cooperation in the future. Thank you.
Thank you, Pascal. I'm sure you echo some of those sentiments. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, of course, I, uh, I will echo uh, lots of uh, these uh, feelings from from uh, Jean David, uh, and uh, I, I just want to dig in the past, uh, uh, at the beginning of my career, which is a little long now, uh, I was part of something which influenced a lot my vision of what's R&D and uh, cooperation, which was uh, the big uh, program uh, uh, from uh, Eureka, which was called at that time Jesse and then Media. And it was a program between uh, different countries and uh, an European Commission. And everybody was collaborating to try to keep uh, a semiconductor industry in Europe. Yeah. And I would say we succeeded. Uh, and uh, uh, this is these are the roots of a much bigger and more ambitious program nowadays, which is uh, uh, which is which has been decided by by a commission and and uh, i was very happy to to see that during this long time uh, uh, and uh, with a lot of difficulties I it happened and it was a, a huge collaboration in fact it was it was a really a uh, two-level collaboration and I, I would even say a, a three-level cooperation because uh, there was a cooperation with the re uh, with the regions too. Uh, so so I, I, it's very important, and it was R and D, and we took risks, a lot of risk. So 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 w what I can say is we we are very very happy in BPI France to be uh, participating in the EIC program and to be uh, to have a very productive collaboration. Uh, and as joining forces uh, on a continental level to address such a problem as you described, Jean David, is is a very important. And uh, what I what I feel is like European invest on investment uh, uh, banks uh, share really a common interest uh, uh, and common strategies with the IC program. Uh, we, we 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 want to support directly investing early stage and later stage pro businesses uh, which are um, uh, long term and sometimes very uh, needed a lot of capital so so um, we, we 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 try to invest uh, where private investors l want to have some sharing of risk that's what we do so w w by the way we have the same way of doing things so it's it's important to to continue to strengthen that I think uh, for several reasons. First, because I think the uh, the national or the regional invest public investment banks they have a very good vision of their national or regional um, I would say uh, environment. They know the players. They have uh, deep roots uh, on that, and they can help speed up the process of choosing the right path and the right uh, the right projects and the right companies so it's not they have to choose it's they can help uh, i didn't say they they should choose uh, of course everybody has its own free will but uh, i think there is a kind of collaboration on that which is very possible and very desirable and then when we look at the global necessity we see at least in france and i know it's the case in most of europe we see more and more uh, startups which are able to come from round A to round B, round C. And when you take some of these startups, they, they need some money, but when you took deep tech companies, they need a lot of money. Yeah. They need really a lot of money for a long time because they, they will be, in a lot of cases, something we all dream about is big new factories. And that needs ma money. And if to do that, you need money, you need expertise, you need access to uh, uh, to uh, foreign countries, and bonding up together, putting the money together, putting the expertise together, is key. Well, I think just one brief follow-up question, since we're we're running short of time. And today we're looking at, if you like, the intersection between the technology and the sustainability aspect. So I do want to ask you, you know, we've got these challenges at EU level, we've got our targets as well, the European Green Deal, and the commitments there is to cut greenhouse gas emission by 55% by 2030 and achieve a net zero carbon economy by 2050. Um, 
Jean David, just first, I mean, what can the EIC do to support these sort of sustainable uh, solutions? Um, I think Pascal said something absolutely um, relevant to answer your question. Um, to, to ensure this type of uh, transition that are, that are absolutely uh, necessary, in particular the, the green transition, but the digital one, by the way, too, but I mean, both are working at a certain extent together. Uh, you need massive, massive investments, massive investments. And in this context, it's absolutely necessary, therefore, um, to uh, accompany companies that are ready to develop technologies that will help us to make this move, but where, by definition, maybe it will take a bit of time to generate revenues and uh, to ensure that uh, they can introduce their technology and their new product on the market. This is typically the role of the European Innovation Council. I mean, to be a patient capital investor, uh, together with other investors, and we have already a number of investments where we did it together with BPI France and other investors uh, of the same kind, I mean, promotional institution, but also private one, uh, in order to prepare, in fact, the future where gradually the kind of investors that we are, we will step out. This is the first thing. So this is the kind of things that we are doing on the EIC. Second thing is that money is absolutely necessary, but money is not enough. I mean, you have to help this kind of company also uh, to achieve this possible uh, achievement, um, uh, to, to penetrate the market, to understand better the market, to have a better idea of what are the regulatory uh, environment. Uh, and therefore, you need to provide them with services, with what we are calling business acceleration services. I mean, one of the things that uh, we have launched also is um, uh, to uh, identify a number of partners uh, with whom we can work in order to provide this kind of services uh, to this company. And these services could be of different form. I mean, of course, everybody has in, has in mind the ideas of uh, mentoring, coaching, and things like this, but even more than this, uh, to, uh, to have resources in terms of how to better uh, manage your intellectual property rights, how to, um, to be in touch with the key actors that are driving the market, I mean, some large corporate or investors or public procurers, because in this kind of new technologies that will have a huge impact on the market and the way we live, um, public procurer will play a key role because by definition they will validate the technology if they buy this kind of technology. So it's very important to create this kind of things. And I know that, uh, Bepi, I mean, you are also contributing to this kind of uh, services. And we would like at the level of the EIC to expand our business acceleration services. We have a new approach that we are launching for this purpose. Uh, and I know that a number of, um, of, uh, of entities uh, are ready to join us in order to provide locally, and this is a, a key dimension mentioned also by Pascal, this kind of support. Because even if we want our French uh, Ile-de-France uh, company to become global, uh, and it's human, they prefer to work with an advisor which is from their region, which is close to them, that we, which is able to understand them better. So if we are able to build this kind of network, to share our expertise, to share our network, to share, in fact, um, uh, the, the way we work in for the benefit of, uh, of our beneficiaries and this kind of company, I think that we will achieve our objective. Well, thank you. That's a very optimistic note, but I will leave the final words, Pascal, to you. Uh, give us your, your thoughts uh, before we go into this afternoon's session of pitches. Well, uh, in, the, in, in the long time that, that remains for me, uh, I, I, will, I will say a few words complementary to, uh, to, to what uh, Jean-David said. Um, when, uh, f a few years back, when we, we asked the entrepreneurs, the, the global entrepreneurs, not only tech entrepreneurs, what is uh, transition uh, for them, uh, ecological transition, uh, they said, and uh, what status are you? They, they were concerned, 80%. They did not know how to do it. They did not know how to access technology. They did not know, uh, uh, and they needed money, and they, they needed recognition by their customers. So what we decided to do in BPI France is a very holistic plan for climate first. And this holistic plan includes, of course, green tech, solution providers, I would say, 
and try to link green tech with normal SMEs. It, it means access to advisory, because these companies, they don't know how to do transition. It means access to tools, like uh, uh, carbon index or that kind of stuff. And it means access to financing. So uh, that's a global vision for all customers with a strong push on technology. But we know one thing, technology won't do all, not at all. It will be part of the big effort and it should be part and more and more and higher and higher. But we need to have some sobriety too, especially in industry, in, uh, in transport and everything. So all companies have to be in line with Paris Agreement. Well, thank you. That's a very good place to leave it. Uh, a call for joined up thinking as well as everything else. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, we'll allow you to be free now. Uh, we will, big round of applause, thank you. And thank you very much. That concludes our morning part and our online part of today's event. So I do want to say a big thank you to those of you following online at home and around Europe and around the world. Please keep sharing the word using the hashtag ScaleUpEU. For those in the room, there's a coffee break. Come back for the pitches in just a while. <laughs>